before I begin, uh, I couldn't resist commenting on Sarah's definition of um, common sense. I read this one a while ago. Common sense is so rare, it should be branded a superpower. <laughs> <laughs> there are certain developments in history, such as the development of the Suez Canal that connected Europe to the Indian Ocean, or the railroads that transformed the American West and the Russian East, they have transformed things and old patterns of contact have disappeared and new ones have taken hold. Strangers have become neighbors and backwaters have become zones of strategic significance. Entire groups have declined, like the fall of the Soviet Union, and others have risen in importance. Such a development in history is the rise of the Indian IT sector and the Chinese manufacturing capability. The powers of the world are moving east and we can only ignore this change at our own peril. Now Andy didn't sleep last night because he was afraid to speak Maori. I didn't sleep because I was, not because I was writing this presentation, but because I was rewriting it. You know, initially I got the brief and I got thinking and I, and I, wrote, a, I wrote a presentation which, which I thought what you guys wanted to hear, but it wasn't what I felt I had to say. And I ch made the decision to rewrite the thing, I changed the whole PowerPoint, I, I came here a little early, gave them a new PowerPoint. You can ask Rebecca, she's one of the organizers. So I changed, I changed pretty much everything. And I worked hard on this presentation to write it in such a manner that I can plant a few seeds of ideas in your head that your thoughts can nurture as time goes by. And before I would begin, I'd like to say that if what I say is responsible, then I alone am responsible for saying it. I'm not sure if the, if the PowerPoint here is Tim's. Can we please change that? Anyways, I don't, I don't believe in spending my time on analyzing trends, and I don't believe in predictions either. Perfect. It's just that I can't see it on the laptop. And I say that without meaning even a little bit of disrespect to my fellow speakers, because what they have to say is valued, and their foresight is well respected. But I just don't do business that way. What I believe in our human needs, the ones that exist and the ones that we can create. I believe in solving problems that already existed and have been around for a while. There's a famous saying in the real estate industry, location, location, location. Well, my mantra is people, 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 and empowering them to be the best they can possibly be. And they say sometimes in life, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. So forgive me, Andy. Or oh, things I'm about to say have very little to do with the future. <laughs> they are more about how we can shape it. So let me start off with a brief about the project I had worked on called One B. Now, I've been working on One B for the past two years. It was born out of a problem that already exists. One B was born to address a need of connectivity, knowledge, access to information. How many in this room people have heard of one laptop per child? Just raise your hand for a second. Okay, that's cool. It will make my life easy. So one laptop per child is an organization which is deploying very low-cost laptops all over the world, along with Intel Classmate PC, few other charities, 3.5 million laptops already out there, 35 million laptops expected to go out in the next five years. More than 90% of the laptops go in areas that don't have internet. Sorry, the I don't like lectins, but uh, now, Sure. Yes, Andy. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so the laptops are going in areas that don't have internet. Now, the question was, what's the point of having a laptop without internet connectivity? It's like a giant calculator. You know, you can, you can only use Microsoft Word and Paint for so long. <laughs> so, we, 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 we found out this an old problem. And we wanted to use this. We wanted to solve it using an old technology. Technology that already exists, technology is free of the infrastructure, and free of all the bureaucracy that comes in middle implementing technology in the developing world. So we, what we did was, we said, well, why can't we use a radio? A radio is in every household. Radio is readily available. It's broadcast, one to many, not like internet, one to one. That's what we did. What we ended up doing was we converted digital documents into music books into music, software into music, games into music. And you can play that music over the radio, and at the receiving end, you take a simple piece of wire, 
plug it into the radio, plug it into the microphone jack of the computer, the computer listens to the music, and our software converts music back to books, back to documents, back to games. Now how we do that conversion will take me a conference to explain, so I'll skip that whole thing. The point, the point here was now you can just take a simple radio, plug it into the computer, and you have connectivity. Education, healthcare, farming, this is far-reaching things it can do. Somebody on my table asked me, how does it make money? It does make money, but I'm not going to look forward to making money from it. I'm releasing this technology open source. Uh, because I think One Beep was created to solve a social issue. It was never really created to make money, even though Andy has been quite helpful in helping me understand how to make money out of it. <laughs> <laughs> And he's very good at that. <laughs> but I'm going to let his persuasion pass me by this time. <laughs> now with One Beep, we won an incubation at the Ice House, which was an amazing experience. Now towards the end of the uh, incubation, my business partner quit because he felt like he needed more exposure and learning before he went on, on his journey of entrepreneurship. Now at this point in time, I felt very lost, alone, and I didn't know what I was doing, where I was going. This quote pretty much describes what I felt. And you see, I, I needed a fresh, <laughs> I needed a fresh start. So I packed my bags and for the first time in my life, I bought a one-way ticket uh, with some money I'd saved and the destination was India. I spent my 23rd birthday a few months ago there, uh, locked up in a room with you know paper all over the wall like crazy people. <laughs> I was planning my strategy to take over Asia. <laughs> it's still going on, and I can't talk about it. <laughs> now, there are many people in this room who have forgotten more about business in Asia than I have learned. However, I feel that I look at Asia with a unique lens. And I don't claim to have a different understanding of Asia or business or people. But I certainly work hard to develop a deeper understanding, if not different. I don't want to bore you with statistics. <laughs> India is big. India is growing and Indians have more money than they did yesterday. I think those three things should be enough to get you hooked. And I think New Zealand has an immense potential to be a player in the Asian landscape. What comes next? Even I'm surprised. Oh, so that's why I'm not going to go through any statistics. Well, not many. Now, international relations in Asia today are a unique blend of cooperation, dependency, and concerns with security. And India is no different. Now, the culture in India comprises of codes of conduct, values, beliefs, norms, behavior, unwritten rules, conventions, generally accepted ways of thinking and operating. It's a terrifically complicated country. And if someone was ever brave enough to do a Venn diagram of what this looks like, this is what it would look like. I didn't try not writing on it, but that's, I think that's, that's even close to what it would look like if you look at the Indian business culture. It's a little overlap of so many things. Now let me share with you a few of my learnings in Asia. In 2009, a survey reported India to be the least efficient of the 12 economies in North and South Asia. International Corruption Index puts India 87 out of 178 countries. And ease of doing, India is ranked 134 out of 183 countries. Those are not good numbers. <laughs> Things are changing, but the change is slow, very slow. Corruption is there on all levels. And in India, corruption is mainly a problem because it's informal and opaque. You know, unlike the American system of lobbyists and political action committees. If you don't want to be part of the corruption, then you don't be part of the corruption. That's an option as well. But you just won't be able to do business in most industries. <laughs> That's why I said if what I say is responsible, then I alone am responsible for saying it. I hope there's nobody from the Indian business. Oh. I am there for a reason. <laughs> you see, now, however, there's another side to this as well. You have to remember that the same bureaucracy and corruption that stops you from coming into the market acts as a shield once you're there, stopping your competitors coming in. Now, I'm not sure if you can put that in a business plan, but it's true. 
The second is intellectual property rights. Now, India is perceived to have a relaxed attitude to them. <laughs> and it's true. <laughs> However, you see, you're not obliged to share everything with them. There is confidence in the fact that you may produce locally in India, collaborating with a local company, but you know that there are certain key technologies which you will retain. You just say, sorry, we don't give this as part of our collaboration. You don't have to reveal everything. That works, but you just have to be upfront about it. And that will help you navigate the intellectual property rights issues. I think a lot of AJ Park people don't like me right now. <laughs> Second is partnerships. No, I think it's third. For most New Zealand companies, the volume requirements to produce in Asia are well beyond your capacity, services and products. And I've seen some people go in and make some horrible partnership decisions. I will not name them. My suggestion is you get a, get a plane ticket, go there and meet with people. people. You know, don't, don't be in a rush. Does, does anybody want to take a guess how long it took McDonald's to profit in India? Just please, somebody. Ten years. Ten years. Anybody else? It took McDonald's 17 years. A global brand, a well-recognized brand, which spent a lot of money, it took them 17 years to profit in India. So they're not kidding when they say it takes time in India. <laughs> and you have to remember, India is a stepping stone into other significant markets like the Middle East and the US. And several New Zealand firms have already leveraged this opportunity by you know, partnering with Indian business customers in their global expansion strategy. And they want to do business with New Zealand. They have a very positive image there, which I'm writing very well these days. So I'm enjoying India. Now, within 30 years, India's population is expected to grow by 485 million people. That's more than the current population of US and Mexico combined. This raises some very fundamental questions about food security and employment. Food accounts for 45% of the household spending in India. Currently, India produces a lot of its own food. It doesn't import much. But to be able to cater to these people who are growing in terms of employment and food, India will either have to drastically improve its agriculture production capability or it'll have to import a lot of food. And I think there's an opportunity here for New Zealand which must emphasize its technical expertise in agriculture industry and look for potential partnerships in India. The Indian Fertilizer Cooperative and Fonterra are already working on something. Another great example of New Zealand firm doing well in agriculture is a pip fruit. I was reading this article and it was amazing. It said that their exports to India jumped from 340,000 crates to 650,000 crates in a year because they had the right distribution partners. Now with that, let's move away from India a little. Uh, just before I move away, I think Tim mentioned 50% of India's population is under 25. But another staggering fact is that 34% is under 14. So India is a very, very young country and it's a huge country. Now, what comes next? Yes. I wish I knew what would be hot 12 months from now. And if I knew this, I wouldn't be here talking about it. I'd be out there building it. And second is I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> now, keeping that in mind, let me share three innovations with you. First is the rise of the cloud, which I think essentially is a rebranding of having data on the internet, which is, well, what the internet has always been about. Though I think it has made launching companies and running them easier and has raised a common man's use of online storage and processing. Second after the rise of the cloud is big data. Now, which has immense potential, but as Tim Berner-Lee, the father of the internet noted, the people benefiting from more sophisticated machine learning techniques are the people buying consumer data, not the consumers themselves. Now, how big data startups might affect the life of a common man is a question left to be answered. And the third is we have the daily deals phenomena, Groupon and its 600 clones. You know, if they're a good company or not, is a debate that still goes on, but they're barely technology companies. They feel like retail operations with large sales teams and expensive marketing budget. What I'm trying to get on here is that decades ago, the answer was build the internet. 15 years ago, it was build the web. I think it's working now. Five years ago, it was build the social network and the mobile web. In 2007, Facebook emerged as a clear leader in the social networking space. Twitter was born and the iPhone was launched. 
And since then, we have seen a lot of phones that look like the iPhone, a lot of e-readers that look like the Kindle, a lot of websites that look like Facebook and Twitter. I think we can cross that task of our list. It's happened. What we have seen since then are evolutionary improvements on patterns established five years ago. The platform that have been hot in the past few years, like Tumblr, Instagram, Instagram got sold for $1 billion, as they mentioned, Pinterest, Yammer. How many people know Yammer got sold? For how much? $1.2 billion. Now, they all add a bit of design and mobile intelligence to the established ways of thinking. The most exciting thing to come along in the consumer technology space was the iPad, which I felt like was a blown up iPhone. But besides its glorious screen and extended battery life, it really does feel like an iPhone. And developers can roughly do the same thing faster and on a bigger screen. The top apps on the iPad look startlingly similar to the top apps on the iPhone. Games, social networking, light productivity applications. Now for at least five years, we've been working with same operating logic in the consumer technology space. Let me share this logic with you. There will be ratings of places and things and photos and networks of friends, imported or borrowed or stolen from the big social networks. There'll be an emphasis on connecting between people, things and places. That is to say that the software that's running on your phone, your tablet, your PC will try and learn who you are, what you care about and where you are in the world because all this stuff can then be transmutated into advertising information. As someone very smart, very rightly noted, the smartest brain in the world right now is selling ads. I think this paradigm has run its course, if it's not over yet. But I think we are in the last few moments of such innovation in mobile social. Let me share a clip with you. Oh, this is one of my favorite slides. This is from Peter Thiel. And he put it very correctly. We wanted flying cars, and said we've got 140 characters. <laughs> no disrespect to Twitter, but this is, this is what we are talking about. Even though Twitter is a great tool, but the question is, have we built on it? No. API is released, all these different things come in, but what, what, what technological innovation have we done in the last five years? Let me play this video. So the long and the short of it is, the website is in trouble. I hear you guys can help. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Totally. Not a problem. 100%. Let us explain a little bit about what our company, Brush Fire Media, does. What Brush Fire Media does is a little different. We started in our dorm room at Oswego College Go four years ago as a way to seamlessly fuse branded integrations with content creators such as yourselves. What does any of that mean? Okay, look. If I could just drive the bus for a second. Go okay. Through. Branded integration from a user side content platform is that. It's that. It's totally Dad. It's yeah, dad. It's, it's dad. dad. Yeah. And, I, and I don't mean to offend anyone. I'm not offending me because I don't understand. That is why we started Movie Mood Digital, okay? To focus on SEO, keyword rich trend tracking, and have had a lot of success on the mobile to mobile, tablet based. Clashes brands to alpha based consumers material to their tablet based. P2P behavior. Radical transparency, multi-stage engagement, user testing from an analytics perspective. I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off now, but I'm tracking a trend. That trend is hashtag as okay. big. See, that's interesting because what I think we need is A-B testing over a variety of markets. HTML5 compatible, of course. Of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With a focus on user-generated crowdsourced brand integrations via tablet and or cloud-based computing systems. Yeah, 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 I think yeah, we, can, we can hook that up. We can hook that up. You have 100. percent Yeah, we, we get a bunch of South by. We'll get that grilled cheese South by Southwest. Okay, see, yeah, everything that I just said is gibberish. <laughs> Do you know the guys from Gibberish Media? Get out of my house. <laughs> see, the, the human is not lost on me. That's what a lot of startup ideas and entrepreneurs sound to me like. Many in our very own New Zealand. I think we have to be careful not to fall for these pipe dreams, next Facebook buzzword bullshit. There are many real technologies left to develop. There is no technological end of history happening out there. When every last retailer migrates to the cloud, that's not a revolution. And I vigorously reject this idea. I have faith in our collective capabilities to be creative. And we have to show the world what New Zealand is capable of. I can keep talking about this, but for now, let's get back to track before Andy pulls me off the stage. <laughs> so let's look at what the future holds for a few things. Uh, now, we, I think we are going, an under, going a remarkable shift from war of devices to wars of ecosystems. And Facebook uh, and social media are the most talked about ecosystem. Now, what's interesting about the future of social media is how our behavior is evolving. 
Users are learning, adapting, and growing more aware of their surroundings. For example, do a Twitter search on your favorite retail store. Mine is Best Buy, a huge and amazing technology chain in the US. And between a quarter and half of the results will be check-ins on Phase Foursquare and Facebook. So what this means is now the moment you walk into a store, Best Buy knows who you are. Before you even begin your startup, or your, sorry, your purchase journey, startup, this word is stuck in my head. Before you even begin your purchase journey. Now, Best Buy traditionally used to know this towards the end, when you, you know, use your loyalty card or something. But I think very soon we'll start things like the moment I walk into a store, my phone, smartphone automatically creates a route throughout the store based on my shopping list. And we'll see things like this in grocery shopping as well. I think they'll take you past the aisles they want you to go past, but things will happen. And one of the most important a trend I'm seeing is being less social. For example, there are two startups called Path and Pair. Both limit your social interactions, and in case of Pair, just to your life partner, just one person on your social network. And it focuses on intensity and familiarity rather than broad and shallow interactions, which is what I think Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn are becoming these days. I don't know most of the people who are on my Facebook friend list, personally. No disrespect to them. <laughs> With change comes a loss of monopoly, many times. And I think soon the choice will be between no monopoly or existence when it comes to social media. Social media will be like air. I don't think even the term social media will exist very soon. It will be ubiquitous. Now, the big word or the buzzword of 2012 is big data. Every tech conference I've been to had a panel on big data, which I got bored in. <laughs> the very term big data implies that the quantity is paramount, and some people also think that they expect accelerating returns. What I mean by that, if my data grows by 100 times, my insights that I can mine will grow by 100 or 300 times, right? <laughs> Definitely not. I am a data engineer, and I know that's not the answer. In my experience, more of the same type of data provides only modest or incremental returns, not a quantum leap. I am no enemy of big data. I like data. Data is the new oil. But let's not fall prey to the siren songs of always wanting more megapixels, faster sampling rates, geolocation down to the centimeter, tracking 10 years of my website history. Data strategy of companies has to be better than my hard drive is bigger than your hard drive. And that has to change. We are entering an era of small data. As people put more and more information about themselves online, all this information gets scattered and lost. If you want to find your first ever tweet, you can't. Ownership of personal data and aggregating it from all different sources, that will change the way we live. So many things we do today can and are already recorded. Rather than just allowing behavioral targeted advertisers, governments and credit card companies to stalk us, I think data can empower the decision-making process of a common man. People have a significant long-term competitive advantage over companies and governments when it comes to data and their own data. With proper tools, protections and incentives, soon small data will allow each person to become the ultimate gatekeeper and beneficiary of their own data. Personal data is becoming an economic asset. And soon the question asked about data will be, what's in it for me? And businesses better be ready to answer that question when the consumers ask them. Brands. Now I'm a big fan of branding. I spend a lot of my time understanding how psychology and sociology overlaps with brands and how they evolve and how they are created. Havis Media, one of the world's largest media companies, did a global study which showed that more than 50% of the people in the study wouldn't care if 70% of the global brands stopped to exist overnight. I'm sure you don't want to be part of that 70%. There's a saying, adapt or die. More fitting from brands right now is engage or die. If you want to capture the attention, hearts and minds of your audience, it's important to start thinking about meaningful experiences. Brands are fast becoming about total experiences rather than just products and logos. The future of brands will be about visual identity, advertising, product, packaging, in-store environment, and around-the-clock presence online to support your user. Technology will provide things such as touch, smell, and sound that you can interact with branding. I'll give you a little example. Apple 
as we all know, is very pedantic about to the last detail. Eh? Not a lot of people know this, but Apple has a patent on its own packaging. Because Steve Jobs actually bought a packaging company and they designed the, the iPhone's boxes designed in such a way that when you tilt it at a certain angle, the phone would fall out. You don't have to jam your fingers in and it's all nice and shiny when you open it. So they, that amount of detail, that care is a brand. And that's what's going to define your brand as you move ahead. Content may be king, but the throne is what retains the value and the throne is the mind of the consumer. Because either you will pass the test of their judgment or you will be ignored. Now we've been talking about the future and I want to show you a clip on predictions made in the past and you'll be the judge if my clip is better than Andy's clip. carry more than NASA's processing capability a few decades ago in our pocket these days. Now we have spent some time today asking what the world needs, where it's headed and how do we get there before the rest. I'd like to finish by sharing a few words that have had a strong impact on me. Don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it because ladies and gentlemen what the world needs is people who have come alive. Make yourself come alive, make your teams come alive, and I promise you, I promise you, you won't have to predict the future, you'll shape the future. Thank you. <laughs>